Good afternoon, everybody. When Charles Birnbaum called me to ask if I would participate in this conference, he said, do you know Toronto? I said, no, I don't. And he said, well, you're going to be the only outsider uh, at the conference, the only person who's never worked in Toronto. And um, I think you will discover an extraordinary place in the world that you will absolutely love. So in preparation of the conference, I'd ask that you go up and get to know the city a little bit. So I felt like I was fixed up on an urban blind date, <laughs> not just with a city, but with a nation. And um, so I quickly uh, opened the calendar and I took three five-day blocks and set them aside to come to Toronto. And what an amazing, amazing, beautiful date it has been. <laughs> it's been absolutely extraordinary getting to know the city a tiny bit. I feel like I've only scratched the surface, but when there are these incredible people to greet you, like Carolyn Woodland and Jeff Cape and Nina Marie Lister and Janet Rosenberg and, and uh, Jeremy Guth. I mean, these are people who have shown me the city in an incredible way to the point that I think the ravines are the middle and that the city are these table lands off to the side um, of this incredible network. So that's the great lesson to export is an entire city structured by a framework of ecology with the 1.8 million acres, um, which I've become familiar with, connected through these, this amazing dendritic system of 44,000 acres of powerful, powerful landscapes into the massive lake below. So my hope is to say something relevant uh, for Toronto as the outsider in the room. I'm gonna speak uh, very quickly about one project that is a top-down, as Charles would call it, and then I'll close with a project that is bottom-up and uh, they'll both be brief. In the middle, I want to talk about two precedents that I, th I hope will be useful because they're very powerful and very successful public-private partnerships. Uh, when Jennifer Keesmet this morning made reference to Section 37 and that we can't empower great design without great funding, um, I thought that's, that's important to hear because the two examples I have are public-private partnerships and I'm going to throw out a lot of numbers and figures and I know that's not sexy pictures but I think it's very a very important tool for the City of Toronto perhaps to consider uh, moving forward. So I'll mention briefly the Hudson Yards in New York City that we've been working on for the past three years, the Atlanta Beltline, the Bayou Greenways 2020 which is in Houston and then Memorial Park in Houston. So this very benign image of the Manhattan skyline seeing the completed development of Hudson Yards uh, seduces you into a vision that is quite different perhaps than some of the realities. This is actually the site. It is the largest development, single development in the history of the United States at $16 billion. The public aspects were set up by the city of New York before this was awarded. We were brought onto the project and have not had uh, one single public meeting. So that's top-down, um, a developer-driven a developer -driven project. Uh, they are rigorous, they're committed to design excellence. It's not, it's not going badly, it's in fact going extremely well. But it is a very different project from the last one I'm gonna show you, which I think is much more a model for moving forward. The design, it's a, a seven-foot thick concrete slab over 28 active train lines that feed Pennsylvania Station. Our firm begins a deep, deep dive in every project into the research of the ecology that shaped a place, the cultural history of a place, and that is how our designs are informed from the very beginning. Here we discovered that the original hole drilled to, to build the tunnel that would connect Manhattan to New Jersey, thus the rest of the United States, for the first time ever in 1908, happened on this site. So we sought to create this dynamic place, a plaza that would commemorate that moment, and we developed a double helix staircase tower that would be a lookout that would sort of acknowledge this really important cultural moment. When this tunnel was built, which is the existing tunnel, it was envisioned as a catenary chain of welded flange steel uh, tube pieces that actually hang, anchored from each end of the granite footings of the city of New Jersey and Manhattan through the glacial till and silt that is quite flexible. There was nothing to attach the footings to. So the whole site is kind of a, a, a memory of all of the different innovations that happened here. I put this slide up because this gets me very excited about redefining or encouraging a deeper definition of landscape architecture because our firm is responsible for getting our arms around all of this. You're seeing the tunnels to New Jersey, you're seeing the caissons that then carry the infrastructure of the train lines, so there are train lines over tunnel lines, 
Then you're seeing the structure within the slab. You're seeing the breathing apparatuses that get all the ventilation. Remember, you're building 13 million square feet over 28 active trains. They're not stopping during construction. So we're threading this construction over that. The seven foot thick concrete slab has to serve all of the purposes that the earth serves in other places. So it's breathing, it's, it's anchoring, it's holding buildings. And then at the, uh, the soil tanks all hang over the trains. They're giant concrete basins of soil that hang down over the trains in order to achieve the only thing that anybody will ever think we did, which is the very top. Uh, the icing, the paving and the trees, but actually we've been involved in coordinating all of these layers and it's a very exciting moment that landscape architecture is the profession uh, given the responsibility to get their arms around structural engineering, civil engineering, um, all the geotechnical aspects of this project. So we have coordinated all of that with the result being a living landscape at the top this is a view looking northward into uh, the park above is Hudson Boulevard Park by Michael Van Valkenburg and Associates. And you're seeing our park in the foreground. Some of the atmosphere of trying to create a landscape of immersion, a whole essay on native plants. I won't go into the whole story of the park, but that is an example of building over a structure, capturing narrative still, even though you have this highly constructed landscape. The Beltline in Atlanta is one of the two precedents that I really think are relevant for the idea of funding large-scale infrastructure projects. And talk about leading with landscape. The Atlanta Beltline is 22 miles of rail infrastructure that was abandoned. It connected quarries and mines and industry throughout the city. The city, this is the state of it, this really came out of a student's graduate thesis in landscape architecture. They identified this as a phenomenal potential for the city and that it could become a catalyst for change. And his thesis became the basis for the design that was later completed by other landscape architecture firms. The total investment is $400 million. Um, the direct economic impact as calculated by the city of Atlanta is $2.4 billion. They are seeing a tax value increase over 25 years of $20 billion. Phase one completed has seven miles of trails, 200 acres of newly found park, and 70 acres of remediated brownfield. This is a tremendously successful gesture. The property values are changing. They did a very, very smart thing, which was to start to calculate the economic and ecological services that could be provided should this park come into reality. They then sought public-private partnerships, where the city has done what we call, a, they have a different term for it in Atlanta, it's a, it's a district increment where you tax within a district and as those property values go up, that tax increment is put into a fund that can be spent in that district. The last project I'll talk about does that as well. So that's their uh, method for raising the funds. Uh, they've also been very careful because it's a grassroots movement. They've worked with lots of local citizens and artists. It's uh, very much the way Jeff was talking about Evergreen Brickworks. It sort of grew up from the ground. The citizens who use it every day, they own it, they maintain it, and they care for it. It's a phenomenal story of a very successful project. The other concurrent is the Bayou Greenways 2020 initiative in Houston, Texas. Bayou Greenways built on this 1912 plan by Arthur Comey. Comey, early in Houston's development, said we need to protect our bayous. They could become the linear park network like the Olmstead parks uh, that have been referred to today. Comey, unfortunately, did not live to realize his plan and development and what, as you know, Houston is a highly, highly impervious and paved city without zoning. So much of the opportunity for these large, generous parks along their rivers was, um, was given up through development. Um, what you're left with are concrete lined channels, all except for the Buffalo Bayou, and that is the river that, is, that runs through Memorial Park that I'll speak about at the very end. Bayou Greenway's initiative took the Arthur Comey plan, which is the dark green section, and expanded it to include Bray's Bayou, Buffalo Bayou, and White Oak Bayou. It's a bold vision. 150 miles of urban trails along the drainage ways. That's all that's left for the scale of park infrastructure in this city, but they are making the most of it. It's truly visionary. It's also a cautionary tale about not protecting these natural drainage ways generously enough to allow them to provide their ecological services that they evolved to do. 
Bayou Greenways Initiative is acquiring 1,500 acres to complete uh, this vision, which is 4,000 acres of interconnected trails and networks along all the drainage ways of the city. They were very clever as they presented it to the city and they pitched the public-private partnership, something I think could be very useful here. They uh, added up what it would cost to acquire it. Two billion dollars to acquire this if they were to create this as a park. They then went through a 50-50 agreement with the city that they would raise 100 million if the city would grant them 100 million. Um, they were ambitious, they were successful, they raised 120 million, it is Houston after all, and uh, so they have now 220 million to begin this project. And Tom Bacon, visionary leader who's the president of the, of the board of Bayou Greenways 2020, he said, if you're going to talk about this project, he said, we have budgeted $10 million annually for the maintenance of this project and we're raising that money. We cannot design this, hand it to the city, and burden them with undue maintenance. What's exciting for the city is that they're seeing a $34 million annual tax increase from the benefits of this dendritic system with 1.5 miles of the two-thirds of the city's population. So for the lower 48, uh, Houston is the third largest city. So getting this much green space that close to people in one of the most impervious cities in the world is a real feat. They've calculated that the total benefits to the city um, are uh, 300 million annually on this 100 million of cities investment. That gets people to listen. So in a way, we're all, we're, we all care passionately about design and ecology and, um, and our, our cultural assets, but we have to get smarter as a profession about, about speaking about numbers, about valuing what we can contribute, what our profession can give back to a city, how to structure that, and how to be very convincing to a city council that they will long-term see the benefits of these systems. As our cities become more dense, we have to fight for the preservation of these important places. These are some of the images of the successful first pieces. A large part of this was designed by SWA, um, Buffalo Bayou Park, and it's just spectacular. They have not erased the character, they're building on the ecologies, they're being smart about this, it's low maintenance, it's not high material costs or maintenance. So I'm gonna end with a run through of Memorial Park. This is a 1,500 acre park in the center of Houston. We did a survey of runners and we found that 100, I think it was 168 zip codes were represented in 48 hours by runners using this park. The financial model here is a TERS, a tax increment reinvestment zone. The uptown TERS is this district right here. Downtown is off the slide to the, to the east. Memorial Park fell outside of any increment zone. A visionary mayor in her third term um, went to the uptown TERS and they said, you boys have done well and you have this incredible asset right next to you that is very, very sick. And I'll explain to you why it's so sick. I said, how about if I take my fat pen and redesign the boundary so that you can spend all this money inside the park? And they were thrilled. They said, we would love to help the park. Uh, we have benefited from the economy and we would like to share that with the rest of Houston. So suddenly the boundary of the uptown TERS includes this giant park to the northeast. I put the two images of the Greensward plan over it to just give you a sense of the scale. It is twice the size of Central Park. This was, well, like probably every park project anyone uh, in the office has done, no one wanted it to change. They're like, don't touch it, we love it, it's fine. But I'm gonna show you a few of, I mean, it didn't take an outsider, somebody from out of town to show you some of the problems. Um, but what we had to do was explain to the public over 10 months of public meetings and public process. We had 3,300 Houstonians participating in this project. They have uh, weighed in, they've come to Charette's. We have a team of 70 consultants, all from Houston. The strategy was this has to belong to the people of the city. We're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars of construction in a very fast period of time. We're talking about the appropriation or the use of the, the TERS. Is, there's still public funds. It has to be annually approved by the mayor. So there's a lot of control from the public sector about how the money is spent. But the park was beloved by everyone in the city. 
millions, 10 million people a year ran the Seymour Lieberman Trail, this three mile loop through the heart of the park, but much of it had gone abandoned. What you're seeing in this slide is uh, the greater Deltaic Plain. Memorial Park is this red box here to the end. But you're seeing uh, when the last ice age ended 18 million years ago, this is the rooftop of the Rocky Mountains has made its way to the Gulf. And so you're seeing with the retreat of the last ice age 18 million years ago, I was joking with Nina Marie because she referred to it as 13 million years ago. So, oh, that's right, it took five million years for the ice to retreat. Like that's, we're thinking at a geologic scale as landscape architects. And I love that, that fact that, you know, Canadian ice age ended 13 million years ago in the Houstonian uh, 18. Um, that's some slow moving ice, but, um, <laughs> Uh, this deltaic plain has a lot of really interesting characteristics and we thought, well, what has happened here? We have to learn the ecology because, um, because that will be the foundation, the framework of our story. This is just a gold mine. This was so exciting. The range of the uh, Atacapan uh, linguistic stock of Southeast Texas from 1528 to 1722. We found that the Aronkoa and the Karankoa Indians occupied this place. We did soil borings, very deep soil borings through the ground to find that for 400 years we found repetitive layers of ash deposit, understanding that this was a highly managed landscape by the Native Americans. The Spanish came first in the 1500s, and then Western European, other European settlers came after that and started to develop this land. This land has been heavily managed grasslands for, by Native Americans. It's been farmland, uh, orchards. It was later, uh, it was later on the Reinerman tract. It was um, timber land with a pine production uh, for pulp and construction timber. Um, later, it was leveled and pretty much, well, it was already level. I mean, you have one foot of slope per mile in Houston, just as you work on your grading plans, if there are any students in the room. Um, that's frightening. <laughs> um, it was cleared, rather, to become Camp Logan, a training camp for World War I soldiers. After that, I'm a hog, um, a very wealthy woman. Her father, grandfather, I believe, was at Spindletop, one of the first petroleum families of Texas. Um, she uh, decided that she would acquire the park and then sell it to the city of Houston, essentially at cost, to make a park. She bought Camp Logan, excuse me, uh, this, this training camp, 1,500 acres. The city bought it over time as it could, and then uh, they commissioned, under her guidance, Hare and Hare to do a master plan of the park. Hare and Hare, the Hare and Hare plan came out between World War I and World War II. World War II basically uh, stopped all efforts and very little of the plan was ever built. Our partner in this project is Susan Turner Associates. Uh, Susan's on the board of the Cultural Landscape Foundation as I am and she was instrumental in this deep dive into the history that would then shape the resulting design. So what you're seeing in white is the dumping ground of highways and freeways. This park has been seen as open space, green space, empty space, we got to get those words out of our vocabulary uh, within cities. The land is full of stories. It's been here a lot longer than we have been here. So find those stories, tell them, and let those stories protect the land moving forward. Here you have I-610, 610 to the west, I-10 to the north, the Eureka Rail Line and Memorial Drive, the Park Loop, picnic loop, the park had been cut into 26 segments. So one of our first initiatives was to stitch this park back together to recreate healthy ecosystems. This is the big one. In 2010, look at the forest cover. This is the wilderness park of the city. After six years of drought, that's what was left. 90% of the tree canopy of this park is dead. And people are saying, don't touch our park, keep it the way it is. We had to make them fall in love with their park again, but in a new way with a new vision. Through the soil test, through the 20 ecologists we had on our team, we looked at the soils, we looked at the seed bank, and we started to understand this is a gradient of ecologies, of very resilient ecologies native to this deltaic plain. So in yellow, you're seeing high prairie. In light green, you're seeing post oak savanna, what would have been there. And you're seeing all the roads and amenities erased. So, like someone talked about earlier, it's a new way of look, oh, like Jeff's map. It's exactly like your map at Evergreen, where you erase the grid of the city and you just look at the ecology and let that ecology come forward and make it visible. This is the golf course, the only piece of the hair and hair plan that was built. So this is our resulting master plan and some of the highlights are moving the sports amenities that are scattered throughout the park into a very 
well-coordinated, easy to park, easy to maintain sports park at the top. You're seeing new natatorium and tennis facility. You're seeing what we're calling the Memorial Groves, where we honor this history of this as a training camp from World War I, tell the soldier's story. This was the grounds where the, the cavalry was trained. This is a horse facility now. This is a piece that Reed Hildebrand and Design Workshop are doing. This southwest corner is the Houston Arboretum and Nature Center. But we've blended the ecologies because they're very much doing a similar thing of restoring these large-scale ecologies. The entire southern half of the park is basically a massive restoration ecology project, but laced with very sophisticated mountain bike trails, road bike trails, hiking trails, birding trails. So designing those in ways that they're not eroding, they're keeping people off of the fragile drainage ways. And then you can't see so well in this slide, but there's a one mile massive arc that moves through the park. That's a mile long level. It's the first time handicapped people have been able to get to the edge of the bayou in 100 years. This is that trail, the southern arc that takes you with overlooks to the bayou, keeping people off the fragile banks, but framing the drainage ways, the barrancos. This level plane is revealing what topography there is. This is a rendering that Mir, a rendering company from Scandinavia. This is one overlook. This is the Buffalo Bayou. You can see the scale of the Southern Arc coming all the way back around to this overlook, taking you through each of these different ecologies. But it's a big, contemporary, massive gesture that allows you to measure the scale of this place and its ecology. This is the hair and hair plan. As I said, only the golf course was built. This caught our attention. There was this one gesture of formality in the plan. So as we're doing our research to excavate the design idea so that this park, our design, will tell the story of the place, not be some uh, logo that we stamp on the land. We took a nod and created the Eastern Glades. This is where a lot of death had occurred, but there were some stands of post oak and live oak still on the ground. We're also, sadly, this park consumes 68 million gallons of treated drinking water just to irrigate the golf course. So working with Sherwood Design Engineering, we've created an entire new surface system of water treatment. We're over a clay lens, we cannot infiltrate, but the, the, um, the lace work of stormwater management is, has become an amenity of the park. So you're seeing one of the ponds that can offset 100% of that consumption. So it's a giant ecology in service to a cultural asset. This is an aerial of the Eastern Glades, the new stormwater management, the natatorium, pedestrian connections north and south, Memorial Drive has to stay. The Camp Logan memory, uh, you can see how cleared the park was. I mean, people had no idea why it was called Memorial Park. It was a memorial to the dead soldiers of World War I who had been trained here. So this is the quality of that landscape. These are the lines between the battalion housing. We saved any existing remnants of the post oak savanna and have interplanted with a perfect grid of loblolly pine. Each of these pines represents one of the soldiers who died in World War I in service to the freedom of the nation. This is the Memorial Groves in Ariel. One of the ideas central to this will be that it's still very controversial, as you might imagine, but the concept is that we will plant these groves uh, to tell the story of each of the different regiments. They're incredible stories. There was an African-American regiment, the 370th Regiment. They had 75 Croix de Guerre, honorable medals from their service in France. 2,500 African-American soldiers were trained, went to France, only half came back. There's no mark or remnant of this story currently within the park. This is a Photoshop rendering, and this is my last little bit. The final move here was inspired by really trying to stitch the north and the south together for the first time. This division of a, of a six-lane highway had cut the park, lethally cut the park in half. So we're proposing a massive land bridge inspired by wildlife crossings. The competition that Jeremy and Nina Marie worked on together, the ARC competition, I'm sure that was in my mind when we came up with this a year and a half ago, because we had entered that competition and it really caught my attention that design could be in service to ecology at a massive scale. And that's become a hallmark of our practice ever since, particularly in our wildlife work in New Zealand. So the idea of, we're not pretending this is a wildlife crossing, I have to say this is in the middle of a giant city, but it's using that technology as a way to link uh, the north and southern halves such that you can forget the highway, you can rise gently at ADA ramp gradients up over the highway and back down and connect these two places. So this is the rendering with downtown Houston in the distance, uptown is behind you and the entry to the two land bridges with an elliptical oculus. You're seeing the restored wetlands, the post oak savanna, and the prairies in the distance. 
So the closing slide, just to show the scale, these are all at the same scale, the Atlanta Beltline, the Ravine Network, the uh, Bayou Greenways Initiative, and then this little box is Memorial Park that's a nested relationship within the Bayou Greenways Initiative. What I've hoped to do today is give you a couple of models for public-private partnerships. This one is successful because of that, this redesignation of its boundary, the tax increment reinvestment zone. One of the great flaws of, and I know we're supposed to export whatever problems from here out, I'm gonna bring a problem from there here. Um, one of the great flaws that I think Toronto uh, could help with or could get right for the rest of the world, this is, as I said at the beginning, this is a park, just, um, this is a park that serves millions and millions of people. It is the center of the city. However, all of this money is going to this park. One of the hardest things convincing city council was you had city council members who are in poor districts who have no money going to their parks. Texas is a state that is not particularly in love with paying taxes, so there's not a lot of cash to put in the parks. Could there be a model for developer-driven projects where a percentage is set aside to go to all of the parks, to start to rebuild all the ecologies, the historic parks, the, the areas that are not getting enough attention, that are the small um, peripheral areas. So even with this model for success, I think we still have to be mindful that we are the stewards and responsible for all of these ecologies, all of this parkland. It's very hard work and it's very complex, but we can't forget those spaces because this idea of proximity of parks to people's lives is transformative. And aren't we lucky to have this profession? Thank you very much.